Hello, hello, welcome, welcome. Everyone is coming in. We're giving it a minute or two to let everyone join in on the Zoom link, and then we will get started with the conversation we have today. See you. We're dropping in. For those of you who have joined, feel free to say hello in the chat. Put your favorite emoji or where you are today. And we'll see who has joined us. And we'll be kicking it off here in just a minute or so. The proverbial elevator music. Vanessa from Iowa, hello, hello, welcome. Good to see you here. And also when all of you type in the chat, feel free to put everyone um, as the two and not just two hosts and panelists and then everyone can see your messages as well. And during the conversation, feel free to use the chat, use the Q&A function. Um, as Shelly and I will be chatting, we'll be bringing up questions from you as we go. Um, so feel free to put in any thoughts, comments, questions, objections uh, in the conversation as we go along. All right. So big welcome to everyone. We are here with a very, very exciting guest today. You've seen me before, Nelly Water from ECLC, and we're here today with Shelly Archambault. Shelly, big thank you for being here. Very excited to have this conversation around the why behind change and that clear, engaged communication in change leadership. It's great to have you here. It's great to be here, Nelly. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you. So everyone who has come to these sessions before, you know, we usually talk to change leaders and transformation leaders. And one person who's always in our room, right, that we always need to work with is the CEO. But we don't as often talk to CEOs as we perhaps should. Um, and that's why we thought it would be great to have Shelly's perspective here around change and transformation as well. And Shelly Archambault is a Fortune 500 board member. She's the former CEO of Metric Stream um, and also an advisor and an author. So with over 30 years of experience in technology, track record of building super great brands, high-performing teams, high-performing organizations. Um, today, she serves on the boards of Verizons, uh, Lineage Logistics, Roper Technologies, and Okta. Um, and she's also a CEO and mentor with the Exco Group um, and serves on the board of two national nonprofits as well, Catalyst and Braven. Um, I just learned that she actually launched, since the last time we spoke, a new nonprofit as well and launched her own nonprofit, Ignite Ambition. Um, which is focused on mentoring at scale for people who are in their early to middle stages in their career. And a big part of your career, Shell, you spent with Metric Stream, um, a Silicon Valley based governance, risk, and compliance software company. And Shell was brought in when this was a fledgling startup um, tasked with turning it around, which she did, and grew it into a global market leader in its space. Um, so definitely a journey there that we're going to dive into and, and talk more about. And as an outcome of this journey, she also wrote a book called Unapologi Unapologetically Ambitious, um, which is about taking risks, breaking barriers, creating success on your own terms. Um, and that book is around how do you fight the battles, make the trade-offs and creating that, that life that you want. And she's also a Forbes contributor and a protagonist of a Harvard Business School case study as well. Not all of us have been in a Harvard Business School case study, um, and that is called Becoming a CEO. So very glad to be having this conversation with Shelly today. And we're going to talk about all things change communications. How do you get CXOs with you? How do you position change internally? And how do you drive it from the top? So let's dive in. So Shelly, I want to start with the biggest portion of your career, which is the the metric stream, um, one that really, really stands out, because you've led several really large changes during your career as a technology CEO. Um, but this turnaround from a fledgling startup to a global market leader is, is really, really unique. So tell us a bit about what the business looked like when you got in and how you decided initially what was needed to get done to move this business forward. Certainly. So this was a, this was a big lift. I knew that it was a challenged situation, but frankly, even though you know it's a challenged situation, when you get in and you start lifting things up and looking in books, you're like, oh my God, it was even worse than I thought. Um, so this had been a company that had raised a hundred, listen to this number, $100 million. 
during the dot-com bubble back in 99, 2000. I got there in 2002, all right? Now you can do the math in 2002 and they had about mm, six, $7 million left. They had spent all that money. More than that, they were burning about a million and a half a quarter. So even though they had 7 million left, you know, roughly, it was quickly dwindling, right? And going away. So this was a company that was kind of heading out of business. They hadn't sold to a new customer in over three quarters. They had existing customers, but they hadn't sold anyone new. Um, and here I am. My job is to save this company. And I'm kind of the last Hail Mary, <laughs> if you will, for the board as they, they brought me in. So my challenge was, number one, stop the bleeding, right? Meaning, meaning try to reduce that burn so that you actually have dollars you can do something with. So that was first thing. Um, and then the very next thing, uh, which was really tied because they did them all together. But the second thing you have to do is then figure out how you win the hearts and minds of the people. Because imagine you were hired into a company that was a high flying, I mean, if it raised $100 million, it was a high flying hot company, right? Everyone in the valley was on the cap table. This was where you wanted to come. And all of a sudden, in a couple of years, all of a sudden, it's like a dog. You're feeling, how do I get out of here? Right? Well, I, I can't, if everybody leaves, what am I going to do? Because it's kind of hard to hire new people. And so you have to figure out how to stop the bleeding in terms of dollars, but also how to stop people from just fleeing so that you actually have something to work with to be able to build a company. So those were the two big things first. Um, and then, and I'll come to what I was doing around that. And then the next big thing was trying to figure out, okay, we've got this great technology that nobody seems to want. So is there a way to find a problem that the technology can be used to solve? Because they'd spent a lot of money building this technology. I didn't have time or money to build new technology. So it's really trying to figure out, is there a problem that I can solve with what we've got, right? That can create and sustain a business. So just a couple little problems <laughs> that I had when I took it over. Um, so do you want me to start to dive into it, Nellie, in terms of what I did? Go for it. And maybe before that, I'm curious, what made you decide that, yes, I want to get into these problems? What made you decide to take the take job? The job. That would be the most people just want to run away from. I'm so glad you asked the question, because that is always the question. Why did you take this job? Um, so you have to understand, I, I had set a goal for myself that I wanted to be a CEO when I was like 16, 17 years old. Uh, I was actually 16. I was a junior in high school. So I'd spent my whole career trying to build skills, get experience a whole bit, working towards that. So here I am. At this point, I'd spent 14 years at IBM running operations in the U.S. overseas. Uh, last job I had over there was a, running a multi-billion dollar division in Asia Pacific for IBM. Um, decided that mm, I don't think IBM's really going to give me a chance to become CEO. So I left there to say, hmm, I, let me go get two seat at the table jobs, two jobs at least, where my boss is the CEO. I'm talking to the board so I can understand what's so different about a smaller company, right? The big company, et cetera. So I can be successful because my research showed a lot of people who left big companies, go to small companies, stumble a time or two. And frankly, as a minority female, I don't feel I have as many strikes at bat. So I've got to figure out always, how do I improve my odds to be successful? So I left IBM. Um, took a job at Blockbuster, where I was the press, first president of Blockbuster.com. Um, Blockbuster proved they didn't have the vision for the future, so I worked my way to Silicon Valley. And I, after being the chief marketing officer and EVP of sales, I was now at the point at LoudCloud, um, where they were transitioning from a software comp from an infrastructure company to a software company, and therefore it was the perfect time for me to go after my CEO job. The only problem was the market was terrible. The market was terrible. This was after the dot-com bust. There were literally thousands, it seemed, of CEOs looking for jobs because of companies that had gone out of business. Uh, I was not from the Valley. I was not an engineer. And I knew that I wasn't gonna get what I call an A play, meaning a company that the investors thought, oh, this is gonna be successful. They're gonna give to people they know. So I figured I'd have to go after a fix it, right? So I picked a fix it. So I knew it was gonna be a fix it. But I was also hedging my bets 
meaning how do I improve my odds to be successful in a fix it situation? So I decided I wanted a company that had top tier investors. And I did. I had all the top, the Kleiner Perkins of the world, the foundations of the world, right? I had people, I had the top tier of investors because I figured even if it didn't work, at least they get a chance to know me, right? And know what I could do. And therefore that would be good. Secondly, they have a lot of resources and access that I can tap into. So that was important. Um, I also made sure the technology was good. I had someone come in and actually do a tech review because that's not my skill set before I took the job. So I was trying to mitigate, right, the risk, but I knew it was a high risk. Um, but I thought if this can be solved and it's a matter of figuring out a bar product market fit, right, what's the market opportunity that we can go solve with this technology, then I had a shot of doing it. So why did I take it? I took it because I wanted a CEO opportunity and I didn't want to wait until, quote, the market got better because you don't know when the market's going to get better. So that's why I took it. And so here I am. Get what you asked for. Boom. And as I said, first thing stemming the cost expend, expenditures, right? Well, that, that's not that difficult. Sit down with a CFO, you figure out what you're going to cut, what you're going to do, sublease, right? You did all that stuff. Harder part was how do you get hearts and minds? Because I had to come in and tell this team that the product they've been building and the market they've been going after, it's not working. And they know it's not working. Well, they just spent all this time doing this. So they're feeling a bit like losers, right? Well, I don't want to come in and make them feel like even more losers because they're not. It's just that the market shifted while they were building. So what I, so I came in and my basic message was, listen, you guys built an amazing product. You should be very proud of your product. The only challenge is you fell in love with your product. And when you fall in love with your product, it blinds you to everything. It's almost like falling in love with your baby. Nobody can tell you that your baby's ugly. Nobody. It's like, what do you mean? No, no, no. You're just not looking at her right. Wait till she makes the cute little gurgles, right? Nobody can tell you. So what happens is you're focused on the baby and making sure the baby has everything it needs and all that good. It's right. Instead of focusing on the market and making sure that the market has everything it needs, that you understand all the market's requirements. So I told them, you fell in love with the baby, right? That doesn't make you bad people. That happens all the time. But we've got to shift. We need to find our market. We need to fall in love with the market. And we need to make sure we adapt our product to meet the needs of the market. So that was my message. Um, and they got that. And then it was getting out there and finding a problem to solve. So I didn't have all the answers. So I went out and talked to the smartest people I could find, asked them what other smart people they knew that I should talk to. And what I was asking was not what I should do. I didn't ask anybody, what should I do with Metric Stream? What I asked them is, what is the big problem that companies are having today that they really are struggling with solving? And what I started, I heard a lot of different things, but what really resonated was compliance and risk. Because this again, 2002, 2003 now, this was after Enron, this was after WorldCom imploded. This is when Sarbanes-Oxley rules were coming into place. And suddenly companies, if they were doing things against the law, or if they were doing things and breaking regulations and rules like in pharma, et cetera, they had huge fines to pay. I mean, hundreds of millions of dollars. So I said, okay, we can take the software that was built by the product, you know, the so company I took over, and we can actually shape it for compliance and risk. We can help people manage compliance and risk, manage processes, be able to prove that they're doing what they're supposed to be doing, right? Looking at risk. So what I did is we then transitioned the company to go after comprehensive compliance and risk management. That's what we called it. That ultimately became known as governance, risk, and compliance or GRC. So we were able to find a problem, able to focus on the problem, um, and then get everybody rallied that, hey, we can make a difference. The product is great. We just got to have to adapt it. We did. And then we went after it. That's incredible. It's like the classic people want a hole in the wall, right? They don't want to drill. They want the hole in the wall. So it's shifting that way of thinking in the company as well. Exactly. And when you saw that this is where we need to go, when you had spoken to all these people, you had that vision clear, how did you map out the change that then needed to happen from there? Because that's really when the execution starts, right? How did you think about the first, say, 12 months? 
Yes. So the first 12 months, it was all right. Now that we had a problem to solve, that didn't mean that we had the solution for it, right? We had to adapt the product. Now the product we had was, was a pretty decent fit. It's probably 70% in terms of what we could do. So I also knew, because I've been selling to enterprises forever, um, an enterprise sale is a long sale cycle. I mean, when I say long, typically on average, it could be anywhere from nine months or longer. So we put together a roadmap on how do we get our product right ready for what we're trying to do. And our roadmap said, all right, we should be able to have kind of the first things that we have out there in about nine to 12 months. So I'm like, okay, so we can start selling now, right? We can start selling now. And so that's what we were doing. So we started doing the research, figuring out the target markets, putting together our marketing and our messaging while the engineers are busy, right? On here's the overall product um, so that we could indeed go after that overall marketplace. We had, and I, here's where I leveraged my big investors because what I needed was soft intros into big companies. So I went to companies where I had some relationships. I leveraged my investors to go into theirs because what I needed was people to take a risk. And folks aren't gonna take a risk if they don't know you. They're just not. Right. They're going to wait. Well, let somebody else be the guinea pig. Right. That's always the answer. So instead, we went forward to say, listen, you know, here's what we're doing. Here's a solution. Here's a problem we can solve for you. We know we're not proven. Right. No reason. We know we're not proven. Um, but if you work with us, here's what it'll mean. And you put together an offer. Right. And our offer was if you work with us, then fine. You don't have to pay us for the software right? Pay us for the service, pay us for maintenance, you know, once it's done, um, but agree to be a reference for us if this works. So that's what we did, right? And then once we got a one or two, then great, we'll give you a discount, right? For the next ones, you want to do that until you get a good, you want at least four or five named companies that are using what you have, and then you can leverage that to actually be able to go to the market. Um, and we partnered with our, our new early clients. So we had X, and they said, great, we need X prime, right? Or X plus one. It's like, great, we will help you do this, but we're going to do it in a way which we can productize it and take it to market. Um, so that's how, that's really how we did it. And you usually talk about like the why behind as well. And I know one of your leadership philosophies is that you have to really be clear on the why behind that. And and I remember when you told like that cannot be, be to improve profits right like that cannot be the why of the company so right. tell us like how did you arrive at that philosophy and why do you think that is important yeah so I actually learned it early in my careers as a manager um in terms of trying to rally the team to say hey we've got to improve our margin and we've got to do this we've got to do that we were like okay 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 but it doesn't really click if they all right I've got to work hard to improve the margin for the company but what am I what's how does it help me right so they'll do it but the level of energy, the level of focus, right? The level of passion is missing. So you always wanna be able to find, so what's the why, right? Why do we do it? So for instance, with MetricStream and the team, right? When we were doing this, cause again, these are kind of deflated people. It's like, hey, listen, this is a new marketplace. All right, when we got into comprehensive compliance and risk, we just named it. There wasn't, there weren't people doing this. You get a chance and we get a chance to actually create an entire market space. We get a chance to actually set the bar for how this is done, All right? You get a chance to actually do, so you wanna actually put it in a way in which people can get excited about it because they see their role in the vision, right? They see their role of what they're doing. So when you think about the why, you always wanna be able to frame things on why should they care? Why should they care, right? Um, especially when you're going through, you know, I was making big changes, but even in companies where you're just making changes on maybe processes or whatever, you know, that my funny, my, what I always like to say is people like change as long as that means other people are changing. <laughs> Most people, they don't want to change at all. All right. So change is fine as long as it's you, but I don't want to change. So in order to get people to actually be willing to make changes, they have to see what's in it for them. They have to see what's in it for them. Otherwise, it's almost like dragging their feet. You ever ask a child to do something they don't want to do? They walk so slowly, right, towards whatever it is to do because they don't want to do it. Um, so you have to create an environment which they want to do it, which means understanding the why, right? And the why can be 
for them, it can be um, growth and knowledge. Why can be impact, right? Why can be skill sets they gain? Why can be, who knows, bonuses, stock value? I mean, there's a lot of different things that can be the whys. But figure out, once you have the vision, how to tie back the why down to each of the individual groups so they understand what's in it for them. Why should I actually be excited? Mm. And do you think there is such a thing as something in it for everyone in every change? Or if it's like layoffs and divestitures and some of these, like how do you how do you position them to be something in it for everyone? Sure. So well, um, all right, here, let me I'll give you I'll give you an example. The answer is yes. Let's take a divestiture, right? Because you sit there and say, well, gosh, we're gonna be smaller, we're gonna be this. Well, how is this? How is this good? Um, well, one of the analogies I always use is um, you know, like a rose bush. And I always say, does anybody ever planted anything, right? Or have a, a garden in the backyard or maybe some landscaping in their front yard. If you never trim it, if you just let it grow wild and you never ever trim it, it actually ends up looking pretty gangly and pretty ugly, right? In order to get the most out of that rose bush, you actually need to trim it periodically so that it can then focus all of its nutrients um, to actually create more blooms and more this and everything else. It's like your hair. If you just let it grow and grow and grow and never did a thing with it, oh my God, it's going to look pretty awful, right? Periodically, you gotta, you gotta trim this stuff. You gotta cut it up. You gotta do it, right? Cause you want to keep it looking nice so it can be effective, right? Well, companies are the same way. They're like those rose bushes. Periodically, you've got to make changes. You've got to sometimes cut things. You've got to reduce things, right? You've got to reshape. Why? So that the company itself can thrive. It can put all the energy in the right places to be able to thrive. Um, so what's in it for you? Well, by making this change, we're going to be able to enable this part of our business and this part of our business, right? That we're going to invest more in. We're going to focus more. Here's what's going to happen. I mean, you have to tie it to the specific business, but think through people think in, a lot of people think in pictures, um, so think through when you're going through change, what are analogies that relate to what we're doing and what we're trying to make happen that people can actually relate to. Mm. I love analogy like a rose bush or a haircut as I divestiture. Literally, yeah, people think in pictures. And are there things that you think that people usually say as this is in it for you, but it usually lands not that well that people think are this is interesting for people, but it's actually not? Yeah, I mean, when, when you make, uh, I'll call it the platitudes. Um, oh, well, once we make this change, everything's going to be easier. Mm, no, not really. Once we make this change, we're going to be so much more efficient. All right. You know, that might that might be true. But then you have the skeptics. We'll wait, see what happens, right? You know, but you don't have people proactively leaning in. So that's why it's important. You're trying to get the energy behind the change versus the wait and see because wait and see you might as well be dragging your feet it's going to be harder to pull and push and cajole and the whole bit you want to actually get energy moving with you it's the momentum it's much easier to paddle on a stream with the current than it is against the current or even if there's no current so even if people aren't fighting you but they're just not helping you it's still harder to paddle than if you're actually with the current so you want to create an environment in which the current is coming with you in which people are behind you and supporting you and working with you it works better for everyone in that way yeah and i think something important is also it doesn't have to be for the individual always right i think many people who think Correct. about the with them think it has to be for the individual like they need to make more money or they need to have this and this happening to their career but it actually could be being part of that prettier rose bush or whatever it might be like being part of something bigger is actually what what drives most people so it doesn't have to be individualized it just has to be something they care about exactly exactly right that makes sense and were you the one that was driving this message or did you work with did you have a comms consultants coming in and telling you about this haircut or like how, how did you, were you <laughs> no i was gonna say it was me and the team <laughs> um remember the whole money thing I didn't have a lot of extra dollars for consultants and stuff coming <laughs> in this time. <laughs> so it was, it was a team and I, and that's, that's important. You know, when I say it's team and I, I mean, tone always gets set from the top. It always gets set from the top. So you have to have 
you know, the CEO has got to be behind it, but you have to have leadership in lockstep where everybody's singing out of the same hymn book. It doesn't work. If the leader's saying something and somebody else is saying something else and somebody else has a different opinion and other people are kind of, I mean, that doesn't work, right? Again, momentum, current, you need it all focused in the same way. So it's important to actually spend time up front before you roll out the change on the messaging. What is the messaging? What are the key things that we are going to make sure are baked into every presentation? every speech, right? Every time we answer a question, right? You want to create that drum beat so that then people keep hearing. I mean, they hear a drum beat eventually. It's just like music, right? You hear music long enough, you're going to start kind of bouncing to the beat. Well, you want the company bouncing to the beat. Um, so all of that, right, is really important as you're rolling it out. Yeah. You want to have the same message consistently repeated, right? Because it's that saying, like, when you get tired of telling people about it, that's just when they're starting to get it. So mm -hmm. repetition never spoils the prayer. Absolutely. Which is why it's important to spend time coming up with what that is. Because if you say it in one way, I say it in another way, somebody else says it in a different way, it doesn't, ha doesn't land the same way. You know, it's just like music. The same song can be sung, different chords, right? Different speed, right? Different K, the whole bit. And so it's not going to be the same. You need it to be the same. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And I know that many people are listening to those numbers in the executive council for leading change. They struggle quite a lot with getting their senior leaders to really rally the troops around that change. And they tend to work with CXOs to then like fall back on the change and transformation team. And they don't really want to drive it themselves. And you've very much been the opposite here and you've always led from the front yourself. Um, and how can change leaders in this audience make their CEOs lead more from the front too? Yeah. So one is make it easy for them. And when I say make it easy for them, it's letting them know exactly what you need from them. So instead of, instead of saying, you know, um, I need you to talk about it more. Or, you know, I need you to, instead of giving them kind of these general, be really specific, all right? In each all hands, I'd really appreciate if you'd give air cover, right, to this. All I need is three sentences. I'll give you three sentences every all hands. <laughs> you know what I mean? But I mean, make it easy and make it very specific. So that way they say yes or no to something specific versus just asking general. And then it just kind of, you know, there's a lot going on. People are busy. So it's not like they're actually trying to be difficult and trying not to support you. But every day they get a zillion other priorities, issues, problems, you know, et cetera. Right. So yours might just fall down into the mess. So instead, make it easy. If there's a presentation you need, to, there's a note you need sent out, you draft the note, you run it by whoever their staff, you know, people are, you get a whatever and then get approval. Well, you send this out. Okay, fine, that suddenly became really easy. I go click, right? Or I approve somebody to send it out, whatever it might be. But the key is be specific, do the work so that it is a very easy thing for them to do and figure out how it incorporates, right? Into things that they already do. Every CEO typically has some kind of management system, right? Whether it's regular communication elements that happen, regular meetings that happen, regular. so fit it in right, to things that normally happen and make it part of that. So if you're being asked to drive change, say, great, happy to drive the change. I'd want to make sure that this now is a line item for the next whatever, six months, you know what I mean, in the bulletin that goes out. I mean, whatever. I, I don't, every company has their own method of doing this, but the key is make it easy, be specific with your asks, and try to feed it into the regular cadence of communications and management system hmm. and being as specific as like these three things in that meeting and this line in that email not just general hey can you talk more about the transformation we're doing exactly right exactly right hmm. and what if they get any pushback people are like no like this is not something i want to talk about um you know then the, then the key is letting them know it'll the different let them know what the impact is and the impact is it will be slower. You will end up being disappointed with the result because believe it or not, your voice 
in this area is critical if we want to move with speed. So let them know what the implications are. Don't just walk away <laughs> because then they think it's not a big deal, right? So you make sure you just let them know what the implications are. Um, and then they get to make a decision. Yeah, I find that many CXOs usually underestimate their own voice and like the, the own impact they actually have. Um, yes. I remember like when I became CEO as well, I was like, I underestimated how much people would like listen and like take like even small things you say, like they would take as like an order and this is what we should do. And like people really listen a lot more than I think senior leaders think. Um, yes. And just under like, yeah, it doesn't matter if I say it in my town hall, like people have gotten an email, right? Like, no, like people want to hear it from you. And that's when they're going to listen and care. Absolutely. That's so true. And you also have an interesting viewpoint about change management teams, I think, because you didn't call in your whole journey with metric stream and you didn't call them change management at all, right? Like there's no such thing as change. So tell us about why you've never had a change management team in your business and how you think they should be positioned and stuff. Yeah. So the reason I don't have a change management team is I, I feel it should be built in. It's everybody's job. Um, and so by if I have a team, then everybody gets to abdicate their responsibility. Um, because in business, if you're doing the right thing, you are always changing. You are always evolving because the marketplace is always changing. So if you're trying to make sure that you are serving the market, right? Remember treating the market like your, like your baby, right? Understand it, address it, provide everything it needs. And it's changing. That means you have to change. So I want people to understand that change is a constant, right? So yes, can you have teams to help um, drive that? Yes, but I'd much rather sustainable names. Um, so sustainable to me are things like, um, you know, process excellence, right? Or, you know, operational, you know, effectiveness or think, you know, things that are always there, but change to me is sounds like, oh, we're going to make a change. Like it's a one time, you know, one moment, one period thing. And the answer is, oh, no, no, no. <laughs> we're going to be changing like all the time. Right. So everybody needs to understand that that's part of their job. We'll provide support, but I didn't want a separate group that suddenly is the change team. Yeah. Does, does that make sense? It does. Because some people just think they are the ones that are driving the change and I don't have to drive it. Exactly. Yeah. And it's a debate we usually have in the council, like how much can you put on managers, especially mid-level managers and frontline managers, if change is part of their job or if it's too much to ask them to drive change? Um, and it tends to be a 50-50 split within the council. What are your thoughts on that? Can we ask everyone to be change leaders? Is it part of the JD or is it too much to ask? Um, you know, it depends upon their starting point, meaning some companies, frankly, don't change with the market. So they don't change with the market. The market gets away from them. And now they have major change that they have to go do. Asking these folks to drive that, right? When they don't have the experience, they haven't lived it, the whole bit, it's, it's going to be fit, fraught with failure. So therefore you need to have teams and structure, whatever, but Ideally, if you run well, once you actually catch up, then it's always should be, you know, more of an evolution versus a revolution, right? In terms of change, then you should start be building it into the expectations of management that that is part of their job. They should always be looking at how can they be more efficient, more effective? How can they address the needs of their client, whether that's internal or external, right? Better this year than they did last year. That should be part of how they operate because you need them to be more than just people managers. Yes, they need to manage people and that's a key part of the job. But the other key part of the job is making sure that the body of work that they are responsible for, right, is done in the best, most effective, most efficient, right, um, way to be able to solve problems of their clients, internal or external, right, in a way that they're happy with. I mean, that's in essence what you do. So mm -hmm. that's why I think change management responsibility should be baked in but again, at the right point, you can't bake it in here and expect them to climb. But once they've been through it and seen it, then you can start to add in responsibilities 
But yes, like I said, it's fine having a team that's, you know, business process excellent or re-engineering or, you know, that kind of, you can have those kinds of sustainable groups to support. Hmm. And perhaps more so when it's that big lift that is required, when you're so far behind the market, that's when you need more proper dedicated Correct. to make that point. Correct. And those are great what groups, by the way, to help managers when they're rising. You know, I also believe, I think it's important for people to do multiple different jobs as they're rising their career, but having a, you know, business process excellence team, right, or something like that is a great team to actually pull people from line management in for a stint, you know, do it for a year, come back out, do it, because then you start building skills and capability, and then you seed it back into the organization. Yeah. It was interesting with like what you mean, like getting far away from the market and having that happening right. And then there is that big gap that you need to catch up on. Why yeah. do you think that happens? Because when I look at companies that are driving change and some of the ones that we work with through Tiger Hall, it's very much that huge gap has already happened. And it's kind I of know. waking up 10 years later and people go like, oh my God, like people are not, not interested in this kind of technology or this type of consumer good anymore. Like now what do we do? Why why does it why is it allowed to get that far for companies to become like 10 years behind the market? What happens? Yeah, we uh, companies get comfortable. Um, and what tends to happen is, you know, growth can hide a lot of issues. Because as long as revenue is growing, then everything must be good. We don't look under the cover. It's kind of like the tide, right? High tide comes in, water looks great, everything looks wonderful. And it's not until that tide recedes that you see all the stuff right? that's kind of left over and underneath. Well, the same thing happens in business. When business is growing, we assume that everything's working as well as it could be. And growth hides a lot of problems. And it's when mm -hmm. growth tends to stall that all of a sudden all those problems become acute. And then it's like, oh, gosh, we weren't paying attention right, to these mm -hmm. things. And we ended up with a bigger gap. Um, so that's one of the things that happens. Um, and the other thing that happens is, as I said, we're comfortable. We don't like to change. So unless at a leadership level, you're constantly pushing, driving, leaning towards the market and how do you get better this year than you were last year, right? And that kind of thing. It's, it's easy to rest on your laurels. And just seeing the quarter and quarter growth happening and, and then yeah. thinking everything. Well, and then 10 years later, everyone wakes up and suddenly everyone wants to be customer centric and we need to drive customer centricity. And it's like, so what did you drive before if it wasn't customer centricity? Right. Interesting. And then when people have caught up, like what is your best advice for keeping aligned with the market and not and avoiding that 10 year gap happening again? I think the best way to keep aligned with the market is to make sure that you have people focused on the market. Um, and so focus on the market whether that is you have a, a team that's actually responsible for customer insights, right? And what's happening in the marketplace, that could be a research arm. There's a lot of different ways to structure that, that can be in marketing, um, but you need to have people have responsibility for that. Um, and, you know, number two, it's also, you, you get what you, you know, what, what you measure and what you ask people for. I think if you're constantly asking folks to be thinking innovatively, it also pushes them to be to pay more attention to what's happening in the marketplace. When I was CEO, people in my organization got rated on four things. Well, depending if they were manager or not, they were manager on four things. Um, yes, their objectives, right? So whatever the responsibilities were. Two, um, their management capability, right? So how they did, how well they did building teams, right? Grabbing teams, um, developing talent, you know, et cetera. Um, the third item that they were, were focused on um, had to do, wait a minute, um, objectives. Uh, second was team in terms of, oh, uh, third one was team teamwork, how well they worked, not just manage people, but how well they worked across the organization. And the fourth one was innovation. I've added everybody on innovation. I don't care if you were a lawyer, if you were an accountant, you were a, this was not an engineering thing. Everybody, right? Innovation was a piece of your job. And the reason was there's ways to innovate, to be creative, right? To come up with different approaches, no matter what it is that you're doing. And so if people are always have that mindset that that's part of what I'm supposed to be doing, I think it helps keep people more focused on what's going on in the marketplace. 
because they're looking for ideas proactively. Mm -hmm. Making the, the part of the job scope and part yeah. of what they should be. For, um... Exactly. Just make it part of the expectations. Mm. Makes sense. Awesome. I want to switch gears a bit to talk about your CEO life, because um, many, many change and transformation leaders have never been CEOs, right? Um, so what should change leaders know about CEOs? If you want to give us some like inside a CEO's mind that could help transformation <laughs> leaders better support and work with their CEOs. Sure. Um, and I touched on some of this, you know, but first of all, there's a lot going on. There's a lot going on. I mean, a company has so many different facets. And when you're coming to the CEO, the area in which you're bringing is the area in which you live and are steeped in every single day, right? Every single day. Um, so you want a couple things. One, you always want to be net and to the point, net and to the point, uh, because time really matters. And the longer you take, to actually describe something, share something, you know, whatever it is, a couple of things will happen. One, CEO might become impatient, might just tune you out, be less likely to give you time the next time, <laughs> right? I mean, you know, all those, all negatives. Um, so prepare, right? When you're coming and prepare, all right, what do I want, right? How do I support the fact that I want this, right? And therefore, here's, here's the ask. But if you just think about it in really simple ways, it'll enable you to frame much more easily, right? With the CEO, kind of your ask. Um, but walking in with a 30 page deck, right? That's not, um, that's not necessarily helpful. So that's so always net and to the point um, because there's a lot in terms of what's going on. And then always provide the context of why, what it is that you are asking for, recommending, you know, whatever it might be, provide the context of how that fits into what the company is trying to get done, not just how you achieve your objective. Because what mm. company, what CEOs try to do is they try to take, here's what we're trying to do as a company. And they try to break it up, honestly, into objectives that each different function has with the expectation that it all comes together to get to the whole. Well, guess what? It's not always perfect. And it's not even always right. All right. So sometimes you might have objectives down here where they're actually competing objectives, right? Didn't necessarily mean to do that because of what's up here. Um, but if you're coming in and just fighting for just your objective versus the overall, then you're going to be seen as literally a lower level manager versus a higher level leader, right? Because leaders are thinking much more broadly context of the company. So talk in context of the company, not just your right? Individual piece. And that will go farther. Um, and then, especially since we're talking to change people, um, whenever you're driving change, people, people are 80% of whether or not you're going to be successful. So make sure that you're actually including the people in how you're thinking, what you're talking, what the messaging is, letting CEOs, where are people now? How are they coming on the journey? How are we measuring that they're coming on the journey? How do you know what you know, right? CEOs want to know what you know, not necessarily what you think. And I know that sounds a bit tongue in cheek, right? Maybe a little bit harsh, but let me explain what I mean. You can think something, but typically if you think something, that doesn't mean it's based in fact, right? Or based in history or based in whatever. It's just what you think. What you know, you know this because you have data, facts, experience, do you see, see the difference? So when you're bringing things forward, right? Bring it forward in what you know, right? Not just what you think. A lot of people have thoughts. CEOs need to know what you know. That's very true. And there are too many opinions in the world, right? Like everyone has an opinion on things they maybe yeah. aren't qualified to have an opinion well sometimes. So that's true. And I think it's really good advice to think from the company perspective and not from the individual job perspective. Like that's my biggest pet peeve as a CEO as well as when people come from like their perspective and their role and their part of the business and not thinking as the wider business. And it, it is exactly what you say. It immediately makes them look more like a junior lower level manager, right? As opposed to a wider business leader. So I think that's really, really great advice. Exactly.
And other things that CEOs care about uh, that beyond revenue, because everyone knows that CEOs care about revenue and numbers. Are there other things you think people might not think that CEOs care about, but that they actually do that they can tie their messaging and context into? Oh, certainly. I mean, CEOs care. They definitely care about customers, market. Um, therefore, the overall satisfaction, perception, right? Those kinds of things. They care about talent, talent development, um, succession planning, right? Because it doesn't help if you build a company, but then you don't have leaders that can actually lead and develop and grow the company. So CEOs spend a lot of time on talent and on people, which you may not realize, but they do. Um, so the numbers, I say the numbers, not just revenue, revenue, profit, right? All, all those things. So yes, it's the numbers. Um, it is absolutely the marketplace, right? In terms of customers, per, it's everything from re perception, reputation, as well as satisfaction, um, talent in terms of what they've got. And then frankly, investing and making sure they're building for the future um, because it's a long term game, even though they've got short quarter, <laughs> if you will, measurements that have to be made, but their strategy and what they're typically paid on, because all their incentives are typically long-term incentives, are long-term. So while yes, they're trying to meet the number, they're also looking at investing, right? And doing things that set them up for the future. So that's also a key element that's always in always in the game plan. Yeah. True. Very true. Okay, so this is a great time to start putting in your questions um, in the chat and Q&A. Any questions, anything you want to ask Shelly, um, please put it in the chat. And I'm going to start with, with one that I have, um, and it is around the people aspect, because you spoke in the beginning when you joined Metric Stream and you were thinking of people leaving, like people might be going and like leaving the company, and you just said like people are 80% of the success. And mm -hmm. what, what makes you think people are so important? What makes me think they are? Because you can't execute anything without the people. And yes, can you, can you hire people? The answer is yes. But when you hire people, you have a learning curve for them to get up to speed. And you have the unknown factor. I mean, I don't know about you, Nelly, but I've never betted 100% on hiring. <laughs> you know, I'm happy if I bat about 75%. Um, and what I mean by that is from hiring people that actually are able to do what you think that they can do and the right the whole bit. So hiring is always riskier than the skill sets and people that you have, right? Right there in terms of on, on the marketplace or in, in, your, in your company. Um, so the reason I say people are so important is because I can have the best strategy in the world. I can have amazing products. I can have a great target market that's growing like crazy. But if I don't have the right people to actually execute, it, it doesn't matter. It just doesn't matter. Um, whereas I can have a pretty good product and a pretty good market and an outstanding team and I can kill it. Absolutely yeah. kill it. So team, no, team people, they are absolutely 80% of the equation. Yeah. And if they are, like, what, why do you think that usually HR and talent teams and like the people side of the business tends to get the least seat at the table? Um, and they're usually not the same status as like a chief customer officer or a chief revenue officer. Or like, why, why do you think that is when people are so key? Mm. Well, I don't think it is always that way. So I think a lot of it is tied, frankly, to the type of leader or CEO that you have. A lot of the CEOs I ain't you know, I, I engage with many times their CHRO is one of their top three people. Um, when I say people, uh, you know, what I mean in terms of who they go to, who becomes their thought partners, you know, the folks that they strategize or kind of in and part of the plans. So, you know, for sure, <laughs> most companies treat that as actually the strategic resource that it is. Um, now, it depends upon how experienced the CEO is. Um, or the leader is, because maybe they haven't realized that that's actually the case. Um, but um, but if that's not the case and they aren't having a strong seat at the table, it's a real, it's a big miss. It's a big miss mm. because a CEO's job is yes, to deliver results to the shareholders over time, over time. And I can't consistently deliver results over time if I don't have 
the right talent in place from a succession standpoint in all my in all my key roles. So I, I need to be spending time on people and on development and on talent. That's a big part of a leader's job. I, I personally believe that a leader's number one job is to create more leaders. What you're mm. supposed to be doing is yes, deliver on your objectives, but you're supposed to be creating more leaders. Um, so how you manage, how you lead should always be focused on how do I do it in a way in which the people underneath me are growing, in which they are getting exposure, right? In which they are building and expanding. I mean, that's 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 the job. Yeah, no, I, I couldn't agree more. I think you're very spot on. Um, question from Christina. Thank you for sharing these fantastic insights. Could you please share about the approach you took to build change capacity and competencies in the organization? Mm. So first is you want to make sure that you're recognizing and rewarding folks who are actually driving change. Um, because the first step is people need to know that this is what you want. <laughs> and it sounds really simple, but it's amazing to me how much that doesn't happen. Um, because if you reward it and acknowledge it, then people are more likely to, to want to do it because it's risky, right? Whenever you make a change, it's kind of risky. So you need to give people a reason to take the risk. Um, so that's, that's tops, which is just acknowledging it, recognizing it, doing all that to make sure the people know that you actually want them to build, right, to build it. Um, second is depending upon, you know, the organization, what experience they've had, et cetera, um, it's just education. And education can be done formally, but it can also be done informally, right, through what you talk about and what you do. Um, for instance, when I was CEO, one of the things that I built into my leadership meetings was I started every leadership meeting with a leadership topic. And I'd pick a topic where I'd literally talk about it. And the topics were all about how you behave. Because if you think about it, change, bringing change, so much of it is how you behave, right? Through the mm. process. Um, so I talk about, you know, behaviors. Things like, okay, you know, do your job first before you start criticizing other people in their jobs. <laughs> right. Which means, hey, focus on what you need to do before you're beaten, right? Other other people up, right? That could that would be something, right? In terms of rounded. Um, two, uh, another one is back to the market. If you aren't changing and your market is, you aren't going to have a job for very long. So you better be changing with the market. And what does that mean? So it means you need to focus on understand it, right? If you understand it, you that's the first step in change is understanding why you need to do the change. And the change is almost always a market-driven thing. You know, companies don't just reorganize, launch a new product, buy a division, sell a division, just because they're just doing it, right? They're doing it because they're trying to address a need, an opportunity, or a risk, right, in the marketplace that they are trying to address in a better, more effective, more efficient fashion. So get people focused in the right place. And that's a big piece in terms of to the, to the overall change. Um, and then it's also asking the right questions. Meaning, as I sat down, you know, each year you go, okay, here's a new plan, here's a new objective, whatever. You know, one of the questions I'd ask is, okay, so what are you changing this year over last year? Just ask, what do you, oh, you know, I'm supposed to change, right? You set an expectation. Well, yeah, mm. we have a new plan. If you just do what you did last year, we're just gonna deliver last year's results. We need to do better than that, right? So all of those things help to build in the expectation, right? Of, okay, this is just part of what I'm supposed to do. Mm. Makes sense. And I think that's a good reminder that people are not selling and buying divisions for fun. It's a, it's a reason behind it to address a need in the market. That's awesome. And I think this is a really good question from Chip. Um, we're in an era, we're in an era of constant headlines of transformations, which usually are meant as a one-off large change initiative that more often than not fail in reaching the stated objectives. What is your take on the continuous transformation approach that goes on on smaller steps and over a longer term rather than these big surgeries that are not easily absorbed by the organization? I, I fully, fully appreciate the longer journey, right, evolution. That's what I was saying earlier when we were talking about big step functions, right, versus the little steps. Um, unfortunately, sometimes you can't avoid the big step function because 
you've fallen so far behind. There's just, you can't iterate your way there and ever catch up with the market. Um, but the best way to do it is to be just constantly tweaking, changing, evolving, right? I mean, I had at, at Metricstream, um, one of my direct reports, he reorganized his team every year. Every year it got reorganized. Um, and it was interesting because talk about being on the forefront of change. He was just trying to every time figure out a different way, make it better the whole bit. So then it just became normal. Okay. You know, we know in January we're going to be organized differently. So, you know, it's, so nobody's getting stuck right in how things are and what's, so what's happening. I thought it was pretty interesting. Um, he reorganized a lot more than I did um, in terms of here's a, an overall team. So yes, Smaller iterations over the long arc are easier for people to handle, more less risky for an organization, right? So it's always, always better. Um, but sometimes you don't have a choice. Yeah, and that, that would be ideal. And then some, until you're 10 years behind and you need to focus on customers. And right, or until there's some major disruption. I mean, sometimes it's not even that you were sleeping at the wheel. It's just that something came out of left field and completely changed, right? The marketplace. Yeah. So like the eight happening last year and this year. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That sounds awesome. All right. We're coming up on time. Um, Charlie, this has been incredible. I have so many key takeaways from this conversation. Um, I want to ask you one final thing that we usually end on are three actionable things that people can do in the next 24 hours. So like small things to get started on being better in whether it's change communications or working with our CEO for them to be change communicators. What are three actions people can take in the next 24 hours to get started? Sure. So number one, ask yourself, do your key stakeholders understand the why behind the change? Right. Do the key stakeholders understand the why is number one. Uh, number two, it's all going to come down to communications because I think that's just such an important part. Um, no, number two um, is that why in some way tied to something that they value, right? It can be their role or their perception of the organization. It can be them personally, it can be, but it's got to be tied to something, right? In terms that they value so they can relate to it. Um, and then the third, the third thing that you can do is ensure that you are celebrating and acknowledging the wins along the way, you know, wins the, and literally when I say along the way, I don't even mean company-wide, right? Wins can be celebrating someone who made one major thing in just the department, but it was a critical thing for that department to get over this so it ought to be acknowledged. So figuring out, right? And making sure that you are actually recognizing. Who have you recognized lately? And a recognition could be as simple as a note to a manager. It can be a thing that you say when you talk out broadly, or it can be just walking over to the person, right? Shaking their hand and saying, thank you. Um, there's a lot of different ways to recognize. But what I would say is you should be recognizing somebody or something frequently, because the more you do, the more people will want to be part of what you're doing. Those would be my three. Amazing. So focus on the why, recognizing the people and celebrating the wins along the way. Love that. A lot, lot to do in the next 24 hours. So we'll get going on that. And Dazzy, thank you so much, Shelley, for being here with us. This was incredible. Um, so many good, good tips around how to talk to CEOs, what matters to them, what goes on inside their heads, how to position the change and um, internally and how to drive the people with you. Really, really loved so many of your insights. Thanks a lot for taking the time. And thank you everyone who tuned in. It was great to see you here and we will see you online soon again. Thank you. Okay, sure. Bye bye, everybody. You can, oh, by the way, you can find me on Shelly, spelled S H E L L Y E dot com, <laughs> if you want to follow up on anything. All right, bye. That's the main address to have. <laughs> All right, thanks. Bye.